everyone for coming to our webinar tonight. Um, I am excited. Um, Shade McMillan is here tonight to talk about uh, navigating neurodiverse children. Um, and I would love to give a whole spiel about her because she's absolutely wonderful, but I think she'd do a better job at introducing herself. Um, so I am going to uh, make sure that everybody's mic is paused. Um, I'm gonna ask that you put your questions in the chat bar um, and then we will answer them at the end. And I'm gonna go ahead and let her get started. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sade. Okay, hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Yes, thumbs up, okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys for coming out. I know it's late. Some of you are just down getting off of work. Some of us are at home. As you can see, I am. Um, I just wanted to share some like quick facts about me um, on, a, on a personal level because my bio and everything was in the registration. So if you want to know all about that boring stuff, feel free to read it. I want to kind of share with you guys a little bit about me because I want us to be friends because I want us to have a conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Okay, so this is me. Obviously, I'm Shade McMillan. Um, so what makes up me is definitely friends and family. So I'm gonna introduce you guys to some of them. This is my daughter, Serenity. She is seven. Um, definitely a ball of energy. She is uh, my twin, which scares me on a daily basis because we look so much alike. Um, and she's my only one for right now. Um, and some hobbies are running. This is ZFT Dallas, a run group um, out here. Um, we're on our third half marathon coming up in December. So if you guys are ever in Dallas, like come out and run with us. We would love to have you guys there. Um, and as far as my experience in consulting, I have a few consult, uh, consulting jobs under my belt thus far. So I've worked with Concord Church. This is the picture after implementation was done. I've worked with the Dallas Police Department doing the autism awareness um, uh, coaching and training. Um, I've worked with Tessana Houston. Uh, providing parents with respite care and um, different resources on how to pay for it and how to find suitable nannies uh, for their children. And then I've been featured in First Things First podcast, Voice Dallas, Autism Teaching Tool, Different Brains Magazine, and Power Magazine. So that's a little bit about me because like I said, like I want us to be friends. I want us to have this uh, conversation. And so what I'm really here about is to talk about the lack of services for children that fall in the neurodiverse umbrella. And when I say neurodiverse, I mean any kid that doesn't think on the same wavelength as what society will call mainstream. So it could be autism. It could be uh, spinal bifida. It could be um, Asperger's. It could be uh, a multiple uh, diagnoses. So it's not just one diagnosis. It's a plethora of diagnoses that go into that umbrella. Now, we are underserving them in the nanny and daycare space. And I want to not point fingers, not play the blame game, but I am hoping that this presentation is going to bring light to a population that really needs our help and it's a huge need and to bring light to the parents and the providers that work with and around and live with these children and how it is affecting them for the good and the bad so let's jump right into it so let's talk about the numbers so these are surprising but not really surprising statistics so United States uh, Census Bureau said that there are over 3 million children, 4.3 of the population of children under 18. So that's the whole country, everybody um, uh, underneath 18, 4.3 of those children have a disability. That's up 0.4% since 2008, and it's projected to double by 2022. So we're going to see more and more kids come through our doors that are going to need help with disabilities. Parents stress and burnout. 
So uh, out in the British Columbia, a medical journal, they put together a series of experiments um, interviewing um, parents with children with dev developmental disabilities. And what they were measuring is how often are these parents falling into depression? How many of these parents have their own diagnosis of mental health? And how that is a direct correlation to their children having a disability. So many parents report to me that they are taking double anti-anxiety medications, that they're on antidepressants, that they're smoking marijuana, that they are doing a multiple things to make, make sure that they can bring their stress level down. And some of them end up with major depressive disorders, schizophrenia, because something in a parent cracks when they feel like they can't take care of their child and they're reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, and there's nothing to be held on to. These parents are crippling uh, emotionally and mentally. And there is a unique set of, I guess you could call them nannies because they, they serve the same nanny. They serve the same function as a nanny, but they're called respite care providers. But here in Texas, ZipRecruiter reported that the in Texas, the top earners and respite care providers earn about $13 an hour. That's your top performer. So this is someone that's been there five, six years and the average pay is $10 per hour. But if you look for nanny jobs, different, same concept, different name, they're getting paid $2,441 a month on average. So if you're a top earner, you're making about 2,080 a month. And if you're just average, you're making 1,600 a month. So that's the difference between $361 and $841 loss because you have the uh, you have the tattoo or the um, job that job description as a, of a respite care provider because we all know that respite care providers they usually work with elderly people but now respite is becoming more and more popular in the special needs department in the neurodiverse uh, space so that difference is going to make a difference parents can't find anybody that wants to take care of a child with a disability when they're only being paid 13, 10, 13 to $10 to $13 an hour, which I personally wouldn't watch my own kid for that much, love her to death. But if you're gonna tell me I'm gonna have to watch a child, any child, uh, regardless of disability status and pay me $10 as an adult, that's not gonna fly. So there's a loss in that. So it's a loss of people and it's a loss of resources because of these um, payment plans. And let's go into the family. So you see different, different relationships within the household. So you see your parent to parent, parent to immediate friends and family and parent to other children. So typically parent to parent is usually a struggle. I've had parents argue in front of me. I've had a dad just straight up tell me to my face, if we don't get any relief through respite, I'm going to leave my wife because I don't want to live my life like this. He's telling this to a stranger. That's how strained the parent-to-parent -parent relationship can be. And some parents, they have a season where they really get the ball rolling. They're working together. They're collaborating. But you can only, you know, run for so many miles before you get winded. And these parents are definitely not running a race. They're definitely running a marathon. So then we move to the parent to, to immediate families and friends. There are no relationships there because either the parents do not want to inconvene the friend or the family member or the friend and the family member simply do not want to be bothered. I mean, there are multiple diagnoses that have multiple, um, uh, multiple diagnoses that have different symptoms, but they have the same symptoms like eloping, um, and improper outbursts, verbal outbursts, and you know the physical ramifications of that, making sure they have a wheelchair accessible. Is the child gonna be able to sit and attend? Are they gonna be running out of the restaurant while we're trying to eat? It's all of those things that people take into consideration when they're thinking about inviting these parents somewhere that they have to bring their children. And then parents to other children. Parents go on to have more children or their kid that's neurodiverse is the last link in their family. And so it shifts. The parents have to focus on the kid that needs them the most. And it's the neurodiverse kid. 
It is the kid that needs doctor's appointments six days out of the month. It's the ones that need uh, to be protected in school, protected on the playground. It's the ones that can't go out and do, you know, day-to-day functions that a tip- typical kid would do. So other kids, the other kids kind of get lost in that. And as parents, they try their best to include their other children, to be there for their other children. But I haven't met a family where I didn't see a direct correlation of having a child with a disability and their other children and it having some type of negative stint to it. Either the the other kid really doesn't want to engage with the sibling or the sibling is overly engaged as in taking on a third parent role or the kid kid just simply doesn't exist. He's upstairs in his room playing on his iPad. He's playing sports and things of nature. He's just simply not there. The parents are keeping them busy because no one is reaching out to these parents and telling them, hey, we're going to diagnose your kid with this. You may want to get some mental health counseling. You may want to go ahead and get a marriage counselor. You may want to put a team together and to see you through this and start to plan now while the child is small so that way you have more odds for success. Most parents don't find out that it's really, really hard until the kids go to school. And it's a, a big, a huge thing. It's easy to have a kid that, you know, has a diagnosis when they're babies, you know, cause you can kind of just sit them. But when it's a, a, a toddler or a teenager or that weird middle school age where we don't know if they're little kids or if they're adults yet, um, that can be very challenging. So no one really gives the parents a warning flag. Um, Most of the warning flags come from Facebook groups. And that's like scary in itself because they share so many traumatic stories that we don't even know if the parents are going to go through that. But it is there. So it's a possibility for them. So I'm telling all of this information, all the stats, all this information that I've gained and learned working in the field for three years because there's obviously a need. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen because I want to open up a dialogue. So I'm going through all of this and helping process a picture. Um, Think about working like the, the worst day of work. Think about your first job, the first time you ever went home, opened up a bottle of wine and just said, I am done for today. Now imagine walk into the house, you can't grab a bottle of wine because your kid is in the middle of the floor having a tantrum. You can't grab the bottle of wine because your spouse is somewhere not to be seen or heard. They're hiding themselves. Or you have other children that need your attention and you've been focused on work and your other child all day. And now you're kind of just silently playing trucks or Barbies with them. It's a very hard job for parents to do, to go from one job to the next job and their job being at home 24 seven. Some of these children do not sleep, literally do not sleep. I have had parents tell me they've gotten three hours of sleep in three days because the doctors are changing their kids' medication or the melatonin is not strong enough or they have something weird going on. I have clients who have been dealing with skin issues from gut bacteria for the last year and only to have a doctor tell them, oh, we don't specialize in special needs kids and you're not gonna find a doctor that does. It's sad. So what is the solution to that? We have to bond together. We have to collaborate and create spaces within the agency space within the nanny space, the daycare space, to where we are making spaces available for these children. We need to get the training that we need to be able to service this vulnerable population. We need to learn what it is, what, it, what does it look like to, um, what does it look like to restrain a child safely? in case they are combative? What does it look like to build rapport and love a kid that doesn't speak? What does it look like to care in and care out every day, clocking in and clocking out, caring in and caring out every day? What does that look like for the provider's mental health? 
And how do we reduce burnout within the, the employment? We have to get the training because as the census is saying, we're up 0.4%. That's a lot. That's 3 million new children every year with a diagnosis. You know, nanny, the nanny wasn't coined into the 1800s. And it's because the industrial boom, you know, re, like it opened up America and our population started to go up. More children started living past the, the age of one and growing up to be adults. So parents are having kids out of, out of thin air lots of them at a time and they're realizing we need help. We need help. We, we're no longer just one kid in a shack. We're in a community with two, three, four, five kids, one on the way plus a dog. So we need in-home help. And to them, that was something that was so revolutionary. So now I'm bringing the call of action to you guys to say that now is a new revolution. We are in the middle of a pandemic. We are getting vaccines that we don't know what is the ramifications after. We are in a boom of population increase due to the pandemic of boredom. <laughs> People are having children. Um, but we're also in the boom of children having more disabilities. And the special thing about the neurodiverse population is you don't even have to have a diagnosis. You could be a genius and still be considered neurodiverse because you think different than mainstream. So all, for all the times that I've had parents call in and say, oh, I need a nanny. I tried this daycare, I tried that daycare and they couldn't take my son because they couldn't handle them. They never asked for training. We need to start collaborating with ABA centers, with neuro neurologists, with pediatricians, with OT, with PT, with their schools to make sure that we're able to give these families what they're needing. Because if we don't, we're gonna raise the next generation, it's gonna be crippled. Because as I showed you in a family dynamic, it is the siblings that sometimes they suffer. And then they, they develop a mental health, emotional disorder. They can't hold their emotions. They're acting out. They're doing all these different things. And that's going to be the next route. The world is changing. We are now moving into a gender neutral pronoun, sicker, like everybody is on their own line of passage. And the kids that we're going to be serving 20 years from now, it's going to be totally different than the kids we're serving now. And so I wanted to use my platform to say that this is something that we need to get done as soon as possible. Let's not wait until the forest fire starts. Let's go out and stump out the cigarette. We see the smoke. We know the wave is coming. We should be above the wave. And it is my mission to make sure that all parents that I come in contact with have somebody that they can go to to get care. But I can't do that without you guys. I can only open up so many slots for parents um, that have kids that fall under the neurodiverse umbrella. But if we're all able to open up slots in your agency, at your daycare, and that we can do so much stuff together if we collaborate with this. And now I'm not saying to change your entire agency or only take kids that are neurodiverse, but leave two or three spots. Train a couple of all-star nannies in a neurodiverse and get them the CPI training and things that they need. Try to learn how to love these children because I don't think it's anything better than, and I know the parents don't like it, is when I leave and a kid gets upset. Because I know that their way of thinking is different, but it's the same at the, at the same time. It's the same as mine. We all feel emotion. We know when someone cares about us and when they don't. We know when someone is there for us and when they're not. And these kids have the same. The same emotions are going through them. And sometimes they don't have friends. So their only friends are adults. And I'm asking you to make space in your agency and space and your caseload to be a friend to one of these kids 
So that way we are above the wave and we're not just leaving these parents off into the distance. And that's it. Very short, sweet, and to the point. Amazing, thank you. Um, I do, we, let's see, we have some chats. Um, somebody said, being a parent of a special needs child is exhausting in all aspects, emotionally, physically, and mentally. Um, it's depressing and very lonely and we need a lot of help, um, which I think you um, articulated very well. Is there any resources that you can give us as nannies and as agency owners and as care providers? Yes, um, so the resource is me. I am yeah. the resource. So you have, Yay. so you, I am the resource. So I started Salon Respite three years ago, hoping to build this metroplex of just wonderful services. We were on the brink so that we had Dallas taken care of and we were working on Houston, taking care of them and then COVID happened. And then we found out that the providers that want to work with children with that are neurodiverse, they are working from home now. Because now you can work from home, you can be around your kids, you can, you know, save on your own daycare bills for your own kids. So it makes sense to me. So I um, just was asking, I'm a Christian, I was asking God, like, what is next? What is next? What is next? What is next? And I looked through all the catalogs of the things that I love to do, which is teach people about this uh, community. Uh, this population. And I was like, I should go into consulting. That's something that I'm good at. So with me, you can get the crisis prevention intervention, which is the holds and things of that nature. You can get that certification, uh, an in-depth look on bylaws and policies, because of course you have to protect your company. You can't just leave it out in the wind and just so much uh, more like information on how to build rapport, what uh, what type of qualifications should a nannies have? How do you train? How do you train a nanny that has no experience to be a full nanny for a child that that's neurodiverse? And what diagnosis you can really handle, and what diagnosis you can't, and how to gracefully tell someone, a parent, that you can't take care of their kid. There's a way of doing things, and we all know it's like it's not what you it's it's not it's not what you say, it's how you say it. But it is what you say because there are key terms that parents always bring up <laughs> when they're talking about their um, experience with other nanny agencies. So I'm just wanting to create spaces wherever we can. It doesn't necessarily just have to be here in Dallas. Awesome. And if somebody wants to contact you um, about learning more, um, how what's the best way to reach you? Uh, you can reach me uh, through my email. So we, uh, so open for all consulting is under the Salah Respite uh, umbrella. So it is still go to the main email. So you can just email me directly. I'll put it in the chat, and it's just my first name at Salah Respite. Awesome. Let me just check the chat again. Um, and if anybody has um, any questions that they'd like to ask, I'd like to open that up. You can put it in the chat box, um, or if you have the ability to unmute yourself, you can also do that. Um, I'll give it a minute or two and see if anybody has any questions. Right, let's see. All right, well. I have a question. Awesome, hello Esther. Hello, How do you help parents navigate through the school system as well? Yes, so I've um, partnered with uh, Plano ISD and I partnered with McKinney ISD during the um, COVID um, creating curriculum and plans on how to help them um, kind of do virtual learning at home 
but I do sit with parents and go through their arts and things of that nature because I went through the curriculum writing while working for Dallas ISD when I was teaching. Um, so a lot of parents request that I sit in arts with them, talk to them about what, what is their real options because a lot of times the school district would try to push the kids out. Uh, what does it look for 18 plus? What does it look like when they're switching classrooms and things of that nature and definitely advocating for the parents um, in several different meetings. Shande, this is Marsha. I just wanna say that is such a huge um, important thing to have somebody, even just as a, I'm a, a, I'm a parent of a neurodiverse child and our IEP meetings, those are rough meetings. Yes. Like, trying to understand like the perspective of the, of the school, but advocating for your child and what, what your child needs and what you know about your child. I mean, it, I feel like it can take, you know, I've talked to other <clears throat> parents with neurodiverse children and sometimes it's, you know, the, the, the school is expecting too much of them. And then sometimes it's the school is not expecting enough of them. And, and you as a parent kind of sit in the middle of that. And it just, feels like the weight of your, of the world is on you because you need to make this decision, you know, or yeah. you need to you know, say the right thing. Decision. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have, a, um, our school district is really, I, I believe really fantastic. And I still walk away from those meetings, just mentally and physically exhausted. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and I don't think a lot of people understand, like when you, like when you, when you have a kid, I think everybody kind of dreams the same dream. Like, oh, I can't wait to see them go to prom and their first tooth and their first word. And when they get married and then when you find out your kid is neurodiverse and that may or may not happen, it's, it's hard to celebrate those school milestones. Like graduating, cause they're like, oh, oh graduating to graduate to my couch, yeah. so to speak. So it kind of, the school district, the because, they have a job to do and they can only do so much. So I don't want to throw it all on the school district. However, the the roughness that's in it, you're in a 30 minute IEP meeting, you must make a decision right now before leaving. That's a little rash. Well, and I me. think sometimes for me, it's making sure that the people in that room see my child the way I see my child. It's not just a number and not just a diagnosis and not just you know, the actions that have gotten him, you know what I mean? Like what has gotten him to where he is, but see like his heart and, and see him at, at the good, the good times, you know what I mean? In addition to the struggles. And I think that that is such an important thing to have somebody by your side to, to help advocate for your child in that way. So that, you know, every, I feel like the best possible solution in those meetings is that everybody sees that child as a whole person and sees that child as, you know, the human that they are and not just the diagnosis or not just the, you know, the struggles that they have. <laughs> and yeah, so it's really absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. I definitely think that having somebody on that in that meeting, or even just being able to talk with them leading up to that meeting is so important. Yeah, because, you know, we all know, like, working as nannies, employing nannies, working with families, that some families are harder than others. However, um, once you're in someone's home for a long time, it's hard to, to, to not feel like family. And mo all, most all of my parents... Um, that I've given services to or have been on my employees' caseloads, they always say like how refreshing it is to have someone else in the house. Um, because I, I catch myself sometimes talking more to the parents than to the kids because these parents are just desperately wanting some type of interaction to somebody that they're not married to and that they didn't give birth to. Um, so it is really important for us to get on track and collaborate, um, get the training that we need, put in all the policies that we, that we need, get our lawyers teams together to protect our agencies, 
So that way we can open up spaces. And like I said before, you don't have to dedicate your whole practice or your whole nanny career to kids with neurodiverse diagnoses. But what I am saying is just like with any other facility or business, like we have apartments in downtown Dallas that has two apartments that section eight, which is like government assistance, because they want to make sure they at least have two spots for people that really, really need it. Even though it's not a lot, it's still two spots. You have, um, I mean, you have varsity and JV, you know, it's like, they're not, you know, it's like they're different, but there's still a space for kids that are still developing their craft in basketball and football. Um, in nursing homes, they leave 10 Medicaid beds open so that people that need it, they have it and they have that space. So it's definitely something to think about. It's definitely something to ponder about. I am here as a resource. Um, I've been doing this a very long time. Uh, I have seen everything from um, kids sliding down railings to opening the door for a CPS officer. So um, please use me as a resource. Reach out to me. Give me an email. Let's set up a meeting. Um, to get your agency on the right track, to get your nanny career on the right track. So when and if you do come across a child that is neurodiverse, you can open the door and say, yes, we'll take your child. And I, I promise you, once you service one kid that's neurodiverse, it's like you're going to fall in love with it, honestly and truly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I nanny for a neurodiverse little gal and she is absolutely amazing, but it, you're definitely right. Um, you know, it takes a little while to earn that love, but the love's a little different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> so thank you so much. And, you know, um, if anyone is looking, um, Sade's email is in the chat box. Um, and please feel free to reach out to any of us at the INA um, if you need your contact information and cannot find it. Okay, thank you. And thank you for INA for having me. It's been a real treat and a pleasure. I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great night. Good night.